We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, we're recording at an, an odd time this week. It's a, it's a Tuesday morning, which... At one point, we were hoping it was going to be the normal time, but it's not. Uh, but yeah, here we are, because, you know, schedules and whatnot, but we're still bringing you the podcast. That's how dedicated we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the a, a con- well, conference call. I had a phone call, this lady, for a festival that they want me to bring the mobile wall to. Uh, she said she was going to call me between 8, 8 and 9.30. Okay. So I dropped my kid off at school at 7.30. I came home, I studied up for the podcast and I'm waiting for the call. I'm like, I just put the phone next to the bed and I will just, just wait and I'll just sure. relax. Well, I fell asleep Okay. and the phone never rang and I, uh-huh. I would wake up and I check it and then she wouldn't have called. And I put it back down. And it's fun about nine fifteen, and I'm like, well, I guess she's not calling. I need to get ready for the podcast. So I'll get up and I'm, you know, getting ready. And I'm like, I'm going to take a quick shower and then I'll set up all the gear and I'll be ready to go at 10 o'clock because 10 o'clock's fine. Kind of at the time we had decided. 929. Yes. <laughs> I'm about I've got like a razor in my hand. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm about ready to get into the showers going in the background I'm like, ah, oh, crap. So, that's why I'm late. I'm that sorry. is between 9:30 very, very technically. That's what she said. She said <laughs> yeah. I just made it. I'm like, you screwed me, lady. You screwed me. But that was fine. You know, it it, it was a good conversation and, and it looks like that that that's going to happen. It's for uh it's for a, a good place that I would yes. like to support. So, Well, we that is good. Oh. All right, here we are. Uh, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You contact us directly. No. Uh, you can go to the website, www.avrant.com. You can leave us a comment there if you can make it work. Uh, I don't know if it works anymore. It's kind of broken. <laughs> I tried to fix it, and then it was fixed, and it wasn't. I don't know. Uh, Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, which definitely works. YouTube.com slash AV Rant, where you can leave a comment and scream into the void along with all the other people so uh-huh. out there. And then contact us directly, Rob at AVRant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at AVRant.com. My Twitter is at AVRant underscore Tom. Uh, we've got some listeners of the week. To become listeners of the week, all you have to do is support, support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www.AVRant.com, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. PayPal will take your credit card or your PayPal. I guess you can just directly transfer it from PayPal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they will take a little cut and give the rest of it to us. And we never see your credit card number. So we want to thank Brandon, uh, or Brandon, Brandon, for doing that. Uh, so thank you very much. Those monies go into our coffers, help uh, pay for hosting fees and other things. And we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, Brandon M., thank you very much for the donation. We appreciate that. We also want to thank our 67 patrons over at patreon.com. Patreon.com is a service where you can sign up and it will take a monthly donation from you and split it, give it out to the different artists that you want to, or content creators, let's not be (laughs) too all over ourselves here, content creators that you would like to support. You can choose us along with many others and we want to thank our 67 patrons for supporting us over there. Yeah, that is uh, patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up, give us a monthly donation, basically. A dollar is the minimum, up to infinity if you'd like to. So, uh, yeah, thanks right. so much to our 67 patrons over there. Well, I think our, if you can support in a, us in another way that's not financial, which is fine, uh, just let us know what you've done. So we don't think Noah and Abhu, Abhu? Have you? I don't know. For alerting us that the Google Play Music Store wasn't updating our podcast fee, which, by the way, okay. Uh-huh. I contacted Google, oh. right? And I was like, dude, your feed's not updating. You can see it right here. It's like all the, these podcasts are updated except for the last three. Yeah. It was two at the time, but then three, uh, which are just, say, processing. Yep. So I get an email back on August 31st saying, what did it say, Rob? I, I don't know. I didn't see that email. Do, what happened on August 31st with A.B. Rant? Do you remember? 
uh, oh the 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 bandwidth limit exceeded thing yep. on the we, website. We exceeded it, we exceeded it for a couple of hours, and guess when they checked it? Mm. During that, they're like, "Your bandwidth is exceeded," and I I responded back to them I'm like, "Yeah, okay, so you haven't published a podcast since August 10th, but our us exceeding our bandwidth bandwidth on August 31st is what caused all that. Why don't you boys check it again?" So uh, the, the last time I checked, the most recent podcast had uh updated and then a little bit later one of the earlier ones did maybe oh, okay. two of the earlier ones did so they're they're catching up oh, okay but uh i don't know what they did they screwed it up yeah there. i mean you so actually got a response from google i was talking of speaking into the void i thought that was I, gonna be <laughs> i thought i had no chance of ever hearing from him. when i heard from him and i got that response i'm like you gotta be kidding me it's like when you call the guy over to check the whatever is wrong yeah. with your car or your house or whatever they're like it's working now you're like Dude, you don't understand. <laughs> I, I think it was the uh, guys over at the Digital Media Zone who did uh, the Entertainment 2.0 podcast. I think it was them. I think it was Richard who was talking about, uh, I think he uses uh, Google Play or, yeah. I don't know. I might be misattributing, but uh, somebody was mentioning they were having issues like with not just it's, our podcast, multiple podcasts on Google yeah. Play music. Yeah, it's so nice. uh, it, it could it could be that it wasn't wasn't just us. For those of you watching the YouTube uh, channel and seeing uh, me drink my coffee, mm. this is the second sip of coffee I've had today. Uh, we are not being supported by the M and M Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, but uh, Noah and Nestle, Abu, Nestle has not sponsored this podcast. Though, if they would like to, you feel free to contact me. All right, yeah. I'll interview one of your M's. <laughs> Noah Abu, thank you for uh, for helping us out with that. Because uh, yeah, I don't really monitor Google Play at all, so no, I wouldn't yeah. have known. You guys got to let us know if there's a service that you want our podcast to be a part of. I I try to get this on everything. It's usually hmm. not that big of a deal. Uh, every once in a while, somebody's like, oh, well, if you want to be part of our service, and you have to have this and this and this. And I'm like, listen, here's here's the feed. Shut up. <laughs> Put me up there. RSS. All right. In the news, uh, IFA or IFA or IFA. I don't know how you're going to say See, it. I'm not even going to try to say what that stands for because it's. I believe it's in German. I is it really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's in Germany. That's right. So anyways, they've got some uh, projector news there. Mm-hmm. Sony has a new 4K projector lineup, all with 18 gigabits per second HDMI inputs, 5, 8, and $25,000 uh, models. The last one is a laser one. The other two aren't, I'm guessing. That is correct. Okay, because it reads a little funny here. So $25,000 if you want the laser, and the yeah. rest of them are for the, the lamps. People who can not afford lasers. <laughs> now, anyway, they have a new HDR pitch, a reference picture mode that's designed to offer correct tone mapping for 1,000 nit sources. JVC announced their new... Well, I just want to comment on that, Tony. Wow. Well, um... I- yeah, real quick, because uh, that HDR reference picture mode, uh, so with the 1,000 nit sources, that means that if you combine it with one of the Panasonic Ultra HD Blu-ray players, uh, yeah. and you don't have to do the UB820, the one that does Dolby Vision, because these are projectors, they don't do Dolby Vision, right. uh, Panasonic has a UB420, uh, which still has the HDR retone mapping. And that'd be ideal for this because that way anything that's mastered to anything other than a thousand nits, it can tone map it inside of the player to exactly a thousand nits, output it to the Sony, which will then tone map it (laughs) properly at a thousand nits for the projector output. So that's great. Uh, Yeah, nice to have the 18 gigabits per second inputs now on all of them. And uh, that $5,000 model, the entry level one, it still does not have motorized or it might have motorized, but doesn't have lens memories. Um, Uh. So the the step up model, the eight thousand dollar model, has the lens memories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. JVC announced a new four K <laughs> lamp based projectors plus a top model that now does eight K E shift. Yeah. So it's a four K that wobble that wobble. It's 4K. a four K panel that wobbles now yeah. to do pseudo eight K. That's only the top model though. Yeah. Sixty five hundred, eighty five hundred, and eight. Eighteen thousand six hundred dollars. Yeah. What, what's the six hundred dollars? They're like this is I literally don't. as cheap as we can make it. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the five hundred won't do. We need an extra hundred in there. So JVC announced automatic tone mapping to analyze and adjust the light output for each movie individually. Although it's not dynamic or active tone mapping, so it's not scene by scene. So it seems to me that what I'm hearing here is that if you're not going to, well, eight K and tone mapping are are the the things that. They're, they're going to be slapped on That's the side right. of the box. Yeah. And on the JVCs, uh, they are keeping uh, lens memories for all of the models. Um, interesting that the, the... So they had an entry-level model in the previous lineup where it was 1080p panels that were being wobbled. Uh, right. And the entry-level in that one got down to $4,000. Now the 4K version, $6,500 is going to be the entry point. Uh, but interestingly, the guys over at AV Forums who uh, yeah. do their stuff in the UK... Um, one of the guys there, he's like, they went to the Sony demo. They looked at all those, including the $25,000 laser model. Then they came over to JVC and he's like, I'm buying a JVC. So if that's any indication <laughs> of how good things look on a relative basis, it's promising for JVC. 
Well, we'll see. We'll have to get a little bit more information than that. But yeah, that's that's a no, good, but it's that's, a, it's a early something. indication. <laughs> yeah. Epson announced a new 4K enhancement, a Wobble K LCD projector to replace the t- uh, 5040 UB. It has 18 gigabits per second HDMI. It can show 4K at 60 hertz now. This so. is exactly what we wanted from Epson. We were thinking it was going to come last year, but it has now arrived this year. Uh, yeah, they showed the pro versions. So there was in the over in Europe, they called the fifty four or the fifty the sixty forty UB in the pro lineup. That was the TW ninety three hundred over in Europe. For some reason, the model numbers need to be different, so they showed the TW ninety four hundred. Guess what that is? And the TW seventy four hundred, which is replacing the forty forty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the prices are basically the same as when the forty forty and sixty forty first came out. So it's like twenty five hundred dollars for the forty forty replacement. The uh, seven seven seventy four hundred now, and uh, about thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars for the sixty forties replacement. All right. Uh, in eight K news, like, this is mm-hmm. still from I five. It's all from IFA. Okay. Anyways, Samsung's a Q nine hundred FN eighty five inch eight K Q LED TV will be available to purchase this year. Europe mm-hmm. gets sixty five, seventy five, and eighty two inch versions. It's the first consumer TV to claim four thousand nits for HDR. Yep. Got a little more people to complain. That it doesn't hit full white screen. It doesn't hit like, 4,000 nits. What, what yeah. do we need 8K for? They're like, well, you don't really need the 8K, but you can hit 4,000 nits now, so that's why you're going to buy it. <laughs> so stupid. No official price for the North American versions given yet, but the European versions are five, seven, and 15,000 euros, respectively. So, yeah, what are so euros these days? They're almost one for one these days, aren't they're they? They're basically one for one, yeah, yeah. That, when it's coming out. And, uh, yes, I mean, the 65 inch at 5,000, if it's $5,000, well, uh, it might not even be available in North America. No word on the, the smaller sizes coming over here, just the 85 incher. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, 65 inch, 5,000 for the 8K, I mean, that's not as high as we might have imagined it could have been. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, LG showed off their 88 inch 8K OLED again. No official launch date or price was given, but they did say mass production would be starting soon, which is code for, I guess we have to start making these things since apparently everybody else is. <laughs> so there's your 88 inch OLED. It's going to have 8K mm-hmm. resolution, but it won't be yeah. cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Sharp, Vestal, and TCL all had AK LCD panels, uh, flat panels at the show as well. Sharp's display include the 22.2 channel sound bar. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. It's got 22.2 channels, for sure. That's not just counting they the drivers up They will not and let going. go of that 22.2 thing that they came up with like well over a decade ago before object-based audio and Atmos and anything was even uh, around yeah. yet. They're like, we're going to have 22.2 channel. That's going to be part of super high vision. And they will not let it go. So I was at uh, Target last night when I was buying Deadpool 2, and I was looking at the the displays, and the TCLs are just so stupid cheap. They are. It's, like, it's ridiculous. So like, I don't quite understand how they can be this inexpensive, <laughs> but I, you know, it's very hard to look at a TCL that is like three, four hundred dollars, and it's yep. sitting right next to an OLED that's twenty three hundred dollars at least, and, yep. and going. These are the same uh, size. I know. I mean, they're, they're, I'm not really seeing it. And for uh, anyone who's saying like, oh, Dolby Vision's too expensive for people to put it in there. I'm like, uh, the TCLs have it and they're three or four hundred dollars, some yeah. of them. And they have Dolby Vision. So it can't be that expensive. I think my, my favorite moment there was when I realized that they had burned in the uh, OLED with a mm. NASA logo in the mm. background somehow. So in all the blacks on the left side, you would see this NASA logo burnt into it like uh oh, it can happen yes yeah uh vestal had a 98 inch 8k model and tcl's 75 inch 8k tv had 832 local dimming zones although it still only claimed a thousand nits peak light output which is fine What's everybody? it's it not is thousand fine. only i mean a thousand is what you're supposed to hit for hdr that's the that's the thing you won't need four thousand <laughs> In other news, LG had a 173-inch modular micro-LED display at IFA. No plans to sell it yet, uh, unlike Samsung's 146-inch the wall. Yeah, they're so just like, that, anything you can do, we can also do. That That was basically also, what that was. We're doing it. We can do that, too. <laughs> Sony has official prices for their Master Series displays now. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the Master Series are. Anyways, uh, 4500 for the 55-inch uh, A9F OLED, 4500 for the 65-inch Z9F LCD, 55-inch, uh, $5,500 for the 65 inch OLED. Dude, those are so expensive. But anyways, the $7,000 for the 75 inch LCD. So the rumored prices we mentioned back in uh, episode 602 
for those of you that are on YouTube right now going, these prices are all wrong, right. unsubscribe. You did say it was uh, rumor only. <laughs> Uh, they were almost right for the OLEDs, but a thousand dollars off for the LCDs, so. which is actually what I predicted. I was like, those look about a thousand dollars too inexpensive for the LCDs, so I was yeah. kind of right about that. Sonos has a new Sonos amp mm -hmm. to replace their old Connect amp. The new model has 125 watts per channel, a subwoofer output with an adjustable crossover, HDMI, ARC input, and cost about 600 bucks. Yeah, so everyone who was like, hey, the Connect amp, great product, but a little bit too expensive, they're like, well, here's a new one. It's more expensive, but it does more stuff. So, all right. <laughs> I, I like the crossover, just a crossover. But it is nice to have the subwoofer open. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and don't look now, but Xbox One insiders in the alpha ring who get the earliest uh, preview firmware now have access to Dolby Vision update. Officially, it's only for Netflix, and it only works with some of the newest LG, Sony, and Philips TVs. I'm just so surprised Philips still makes TVs. And for some reason, no Vizio or TCL Dolby Vision TVs work yet, nor do the 2016 LG OLEDs. Uh, they get a lovely error message. So Yeah, yeah. so this is uh, it's a little early. Yeah, it, it seems as though uh, this is because uh, the Xbox One must be using the software version of Dolby Vision. Uh, when Dolby Vision first came out, it required hardware chips that actually had the Dolby Vision stuff built right into the chip, built right into the system on chip. Uh, but in order to get Sony on board, uh, Dolby created the software-only version. So that initially created problems with Sony televisions in that all the sources had to be updated to output the version where the player did more of the processing than the television. Right. Uh, so now it seems as though that software version of Dolby Vision is being output by the Xbox One, but it doesn't work with all the older televisions that only worked with the built-in hardware system on chip version of it. So uh, yeah, a, a little bit uh, tricky, but don't panic. This is why they have alpha and beta releases before the full public release. So uh, it's not time to panic that there's no way that they'll get this working. I'm sure they will, but uh, there you go. At least it's out there. We know it's coming. Now the Xbox One X uh, and S can do both Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. There you go. I'll screw it up. They're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna screw it up right before they're really they're gonna have it working perfect and they'll be like okay and now and it just then, stops auto switching <laughs> then it's only gonna work for blu-rays and then it's only gonna work for, it'll work for netflix but then atmos won't work anymore or all the all the sounds come from the back of the room that's right point forward i did see deadpool 2 last night it was it was good did. It was, I, I did not like it as much as i like the first one but oh. it was very good um there were some surprising it. moments in there i mm -hmm. i was able to stay Spoiler free again. Very, oh, good for you. Very excited about that. So I'll watch it again. We'll see. Let's get into these questions here. Uh, Nathan. Nathan has seven Ascend Sierra Rao speakers, towers, horizon center, and four lunar surrounds, and four overhead speakers. He uses the Marantz, uh, a Marantz SR6011 receiver plus mono price monolith seven channel amp. At the mm -hmm. moment, the monolith powers all the floor level speakers, where the Marantz powers just the four overheads. But he has an on hand, uh, old, an old receiver with multi, multi channel analog inputs. Therefore, he could repurpose that old receiver as just an amplifier. Mm -hmm. Nathan is considering the uh, projector upgrade but in order to fund it he's thinking he could maybe sell his monolith amp would he kick himself later if he sells the monolith and uses the sr6011 and his old receiver to power the speakers instead he's about 10 feet away from his front towers and his surrounds and overhead speakers are closer to him than that will he hear a hiss from the tweeters without the super low noise floor of his monolith amp will it be a big step backwards in overall sound quality well i mean it, uh, first of all did you could just try it <laughs> i mean true it's, yeah all this stuff is on, on hand, hand. <laughs> so you could you could physically disconnect from one amplifier and plug into the other yes yeah yeah i, I mean he he's not saying what receiver this is so there's yeah, that no, the, oh the, what the old one is yeah. the old one is yeah so I, I, without knowing that for sure for sure for sure it's very hard for us to say if it but, had multi-channel analog inputs, though, there weren't a yeah. ton of, like, really bad ones that even had that, so... I would be... I mean, you're only sitting 10 feet away mm -hmm. from... I mean, if you powered the front three speakers yeah. with that and did everything else with your 6011, I think that would be really super safe. Or you could even divide it up. You could do, like, the front left and right go on the old AV right. receiver along with, I don't know, your surrounds or your surround backs or something, and then the center and everything else gets powered by your SR6011 that really divides up the most... I mean, the front three channels use the most power by far. Right. So if you divide it up the center and then the front left rights on two separate amps... Even if you just did like the the, the, the left and right and then the, all the overheads with the... Yeah. With one and then, yeah. you know... And, and if you were like, okay, well, I, I think that my SR6011 has the best amplifier sure. of the two, then use that. 
There's no reason why you have to separate out the front three to the other receiver. You know, just use the 6011 to do whatever ones you think are the most important and then everything else on the other one. I would at least give it a try. I mean, you've got the sure. amp there and it's worth, I mean, because if you're thinking, and that's what he is, of selling the monolith mm-hmm. so that he could help buy a better projector, then this is certainly worth that time investment. Yeah, 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 because you, you, do, you don't even have to disconnect anything from the speaker side. You're just right. disconnecting from the amplifier side and plugging it into a different amplifier. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit torn. You know, I mean, the idea of giving up a, a lovely, lovely monolith amplifier, it's hurts you in the chest you know it's, it's yeah. tough to see that go uh i mean so yeah, i'm sure he was asking because i've got a very similar setup you know i've got a moran's yeah. receiver and then i've got a uh, ati uh but ati makes the monolith amplifiers and <laughs> they're sure. essentially the same so i mean i i have certainly tried powering my ascend sierra rowl speakers very similar i have three horizons up front um with the rowl ribbon tweeters uh, and i've tried powering that with my moran's receiver um so objectively uh, if I put my ear almost physically on the tweeter, <laughs> then yes, the the hiss coming from the Marantz is uh, I, I think I don't know maybe maybe three decibels louder than uh, than the hiss the idle hiss coming from the uh, from the ATI amplifier. But at a ten foot listening distance, I mean I'm close enough. I'm about six feet away. Can't hear it from there. So as far as the idle noise for objectively, I really can't tell you that you'd be giving up anything by not using the monolith. And then, yeah, since you will be dividing the power between the Marantz and your older AV receiver, you, you, I mean, you're so close to all the other speakers. No problem in terms of power output. So, uh, yeah, might hurt to say goodbye to the monolith, but I, I can't say I think you need to keep it from yeah, a I, performance point of view. I agree. All right, Marty. Marty's theater is in his upstairs bonus room. That room is designed, uh, destined to forever be open to the rest of the house. So can we put any positive spin on having a non-enclosed room to help him feel better? Can he claim any sort of sonic benefit? Maybe he doesn't have to spend money on bass traps. Help him out here. Um, (laughs) Well, that's, sorry. But uh, yeah, you still need bass traps. But uh, yes, that is about the only benefit to having an open space is that some of the problems that you have in enclosed space as far as room reflections and stuff like that, you, the rest of your house ends up being like a base trap in a, in a, in a way. A little just, bit, yeah. Well, it, it's it, a, just, a pressure release. <laughs> yeah, it just goes out there and then bounces around out there. Now, for everybody else in the house, not so good. And mm. for us being able to predict how you're, mm-hmm. you know, where to put your subwoofers to make the best base in your space, uh, also not so good. But if there is a benefit, the benefit is that you know, there is a this pressure release of the of the base. I guess it's yeah. it's not great. It, I mean, hey, <laughs> it's it's not the ideal. It's it's. I mean, if you could build the wall, we'd we'd have you build the wall to enclose the room. So it's it's tough I, for us to say, oh, you you are you are benefiting from not having the enclosed room. <laughs> there's I've had both types of theaters sure. in multiple locations, and you know I have a friend who's a theater I set up many years ago. And he's his theater is open to the his kitchen, and everything else, and it's I I I really hate it. Like it's gotten to the point where I <laughs> I won't let the kids watch TV over there anymore because it, it gets the the bass from the theater mm. so it gets so loud and where we we're like okay. screaming at each other trying to hear each other, and then the kids keep turning up because they can't hear the dialogue. Uh-huh. You know, and we're we're not. I mean, we're there's a you know a partial wall, and I don't mean like partial like up to your your waist or whatever. I mean, it goes all the way up to the ceiling and there's like a, a foot at the top that is open to the other oh. space and there's hallways mm-hmm. around either side. I mean, it, we are on the other side of that wall and it's just miserable. So, yeah. there's not a lot of benefit, man. I, 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 you want to feel better about it? Build a wall, I guess. I, there's, really the, there's really nothing. There's nothing I can tell you. I want, I want you to feel good about yourself though. So yes. I, yeah, so... But I mean, this is not. I mean, it's, it's a, a nice world. looking theater. It's a very yes. We got some images uh, that we'll be describing coming up. But yeah, I mean, it, this is this is the real world. Uh, you don't have to feel as though you're uh, getting the superior experience. It's just it's it's what you've got, and it can be very good. So it's so fine. let's be happy with that. Yeah, that's fine. That's right. Settle, <laughs> man. It's the American way. Uh, the rear portion of the room ceiling slopes downward following the roof line. He has a second row of seats and on the riser in the back. So the combination of the riser and the downward slope ceiling means anyone sitting in the back row has their head close to that ceiling. Mm-hmm. He recently upgraded to a Marantz AV7703 processor, which can do Atmos. And he'd like to install Atmos speakers, but would top rears be too distracting for anyone in that back row? 
Plus, with the slope, make in-ceiling top rears a bad choice. He went into this attic, and it does appear that he has enough physical space to install the, the in-ceilings in that slope part of the ceiling. Maybe he should just opt for two overhead speakers instead of four. What do we think? Okay, so if we look at this room, uh, there's a there's a screen at the front. Uh, there's a wall on the left. I presume the right side is open to the rest of the house. Yes, yeah, because that's and as he described that uh, that the room is open. So, yep. Right there's a love. There, there's a, uh, a, a home theater seating in here in the front row. There's a love seat in the center with two seats on either side. It's all connected, and then behind that looks like there's a f couch and a chair. Yep. But it's up on a riser. Like, up on the riser. Now, where do you sit? Because I'm guessing you he sit sits in, in the that front. love the love seat. In which case, I mean, uh, I would do. I'd be honest with you. I would do top, middles, and front heights, and put the top middles like over right behind a little bit behind the front row of seats i mean basically where the projector is like uh, the, the projector is mounted yeah. to what is still the flat part of the ceiling and that's just a teeny bit behind where the front row of seats yeah. are i i do i do i, I think that because you, you I, you're not gonna be able to do top rears i don't think uh yeah that's a bit you, tricky yeah you i mean you could but you're right they're gonna be blaring on those people who are right there that being said you know whoever you relegate to the back seats you know it sucks to be them anyhow so <laughs> i mean uh, he did say the uh, in his email that the back seats are infrequently used so yeah i don't think it's a gigantic worry about that back row i i would place them optimally for you in mm -hmm. your front row and maybe just cheat them back just a tiny bit just to help that that back row get some overhead effects as well but i i would do top middles and front heights yeah i i think right on that that still flat portion of the ceiling, right where the projector is is mounted, uh, you know, to, to either side of your projector, essentially, that will be top middles for that front row. The back row gets what it gets, but they're still getting overhead effects. And yeah. then you're going to have uh, front heights. I don't know what about five feet in front of your seat. Yeah, I think it'll work nicely. Yeah, and this is, I mean, it's all carpeted. The seats mm -hmm. are the seats in the front are leather. The seats in the back are plush. You know, he's got some blackout drapes. It looks like on the left. The thing, this, and it's all very beigey, but it's very, it's a very well put together theater here. It's yeah, a it's very nice and nice, clean. Nice clean theater. And he and vacuumed. Thank you for that. It's always <laughs> nice when you vacuum. And your little dog is very cute. So you can tell tell whoever is that is important to that I think your dog's cute. All right. He said a couple of photos of his room. Does anything jump out as something he can improve, particularly anything in the way of sound treatments uh, that we think would make a big improvement? Now, big improvement is uh, relative, but uh, right. he's got no sound treatments in here so other than other than carpet yes other than carpet and i mean less that 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 band of brothers poster on the side wall is actually an acoustical treatment <laughs> which i doubt then he's got no acoustic treatments here so where would we put acoustic treatments in a room like this i, I mean i'm point. looking at the back of the room mostly because that looks hard and reflective and you've got the angled ceiling yeah. and i'm like i would i would have some absorption in the back of the room as my top priority in here Right, I was thinking there and in the, behind the front speakers. Uh, Possibly, into, yeah. Into that, I mean, I was thinking on that left wall right. somewhere because the right wall is open, right. so you want the left wall to be absorptive. Your band of brothers poster has to go or be transformed into an acoustic. Yeah, treatment. transform it into a into a printed acoustic panel, and no one will be the wiser. Yeah, if you can figure out how to do that these days legally, or <laughs> uh, but that, those are those would be the places I would put. I put all along mm -hmm. that that angled section of the wall, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, just like panel, panel, panel. I mean, you can you don't have to. I mean, if you did the whole thing, that would be fine too. But I doubt that you're going to. So a couple I mean, panels you could back there. Even get fabric that is quite closely color matched to what's there, yeah. so that visually it doesn't look totally different. But it would. Right. Uh, I think that would that would help. If if anything, we're going to make a noticeable acoustic difference. In my opinion, it would be having absorption on that angled part of the ceiling behind you there. Right. All right. So he's interested in getting an Nvidia Shield, but do we think a new version will be coming out soon? He doesn't want to buy right now if a better version is only a couple of months away or something. Uh. I have heard nothing, and I, in fact, it, sometimes you get kind of a sense of when they're going to release yeah. something new. I don't get that feeling about the NVIDIA Shield. I I, I feel like this is a, a product that they're just going to keep supporting rather than... Uh, I, I feel like if 8K comes <laughs> really strong, that's when the NVIDIA Shield 2 would come out. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Nvidia it. Shield uh, or Nvidia rather, they do have their uh, their newer X2 Tegra processor, and some people were thinking, okay, maybe since they have that, they'll replace the original Tegra processor, which is what's powering the Nvidia Shield, and have an updated version. It's it's certainly not impossible. Um, the current Nvidia Shield has the exact same chips as the original Nvidia Shield from two years ago, so it is a a two year old product at this point. Uh, but at the same time. It's still more powerful than just about any other, you know, standalone streaming box that's out there. Um, they are talking about getting the software version of Dolby Vision going mm. on it. So adding Dolby Vision to it is not impossible at all. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't know if anything's coming out. I can't say I'd be like utterly shocked if it did because they do have that new process that they could. But at the same time, they don't really have a competitive reason why they need to. So they yeah. could just continue to make a good profit or drop the price, making it even more attractive. And I think that's probably more likely. Right. All right. Sushmit on Twitter. First an update. Sushmit applied our advice in his basement theater uh, almost is almost complete now. He says he loves his Harmony remote, his BenQ HT2050A projector, his Focal Little Bird surrounds, and his 92-inch projection screen, which ended up, ended up being a fixed frame model. So, but if you look at the thing before, it was kind of this little in room. If I remember correctly, there's a staircase on the left. There is, yeah, and he had a, a slightly larger room to the, the other, other side. side of the staircase, but it was very oddly shaped and it would be difficult yeah. to work with. So we're like, yeah, use, let's use this more rectangular uh, one that's slightly smaller, but that's what we recommended. That's what he went for, and now we can see some of the results yeah so before it was like a little workout room and it had like a little refrigerator it looks like in there and a, and a keyboard of some sort and now it's got a 92 inch screen it's all very dark and yep <laughs> there's a uh a couch which you have to kind of it's pushed up to the right wall and you have to kind of walk around which is i think was what we kind of decided yeah it's a, that's yeah. absolutely fine in my opinion it looks yeah. it looks very nice in there that looks like a very comfortable and yeah. pleasing place to watch a movie on a nice on the right screen the right side of the couch is that L thing that comes mm -hmm. out, you know, where you just it's just a, f a built in footrest and he's got like the big plush uh, ottoman in the center. Yeah. There. And he's got some towers. It's looking good, man. Good. That looks yeah. like a nice place. So anyways, this question, uh, he's seeing Judder when he's watching Blu-rays and there's a slow moving pan and if there's a slow moving panning shot, any way to improve that? So you've got some sort of video processing going on, my friend. That's what it sounds like to me. So, yeah, it's... Um, I, I can't be 100% sure I'm going to be able to help you with this because the, the BenQ HT2050A, uh, it mentions in its inputs that um, it's basically looking for 1080p60. <laughs> it does right. say it's compatible with a 1080p24 input, but I'm not sure what it does as far as, um, you know, uh, does it drive it at 72 hertz? Or, um, does it drop it down to 48 hertz? Uh, it's not exactly clear what it does with a 1080p24 signal. It, a lot of lower priced ones just t turn it into 60 anyway. And right. that might explain your judder. That said, if you go into the BenQ's advanced settings in its setup menu, you do have the option to turn on film mode. And that's what's supposed to detect a 24 uh, frames so per second. So you think it's a pull down that's messing everything up? Yeah. I mean, that's where Judder mostly comes from. Yeah. It's from, from turning 24 into 60. Uh, yeah. So turning on the film mode and then making sure that your source device is also set to output 24 hertz. That uh, So try that because mm -hmm. that... If the uh, BenQ does turn on like a 72 hertz refresh instead of 60 or even a 48 hertz refresh instead of 60, having the film mode on and the source device set to output 24, that should get the judder as low as it can. There is still just inherent judder in film. And when you blow it up to an image much larger than you've ever been used to, you're just going to see that. Shouldn't be that pronounced, though. It shouldn't I mean... be that pronounced, though, no. Uh, so the other thing you could do is... If that doesn't work, turning on the film mode in the BenQ and then making sure your sources are outputting 24 hertz, if that still gives you the judder, uh, you could try having your source output 60 hertz. There's going to be judder inherently because it's converting 24 to 60 and you're going to get the 3-2 pull down. Uh, but then you can turn on again in the advanced settings of the BenQ. It has a fast mode, which turns off any processing that the BenQ is there. It's mostly there for games. Right? right, it's like the uh, the lowest latency mode. But turning on that fast mode, make sure that the BenQ isn't changing anything, and then it's only compatible with a 60 hertz signal at that point. I was going to um, say, couldn't he just go into his sources and just turn them all to 1080p 60, yeah. and then give the BenQ what it wants, and then 
he's done with it. Exactly. Yeah, that that is what I'm advocating. If the 24 doesn't work, then I would advocate for that. Make sure the sources are outputting 60, and then turn on the fast mode, and then your your the BenQ is just throwing the pixels up there as it receives them. And that should that should fix that problem for yeah. sure. One of those two solutions. All right, Ken. I'm sorry, Keith. I got a text, and that text, a, a, a announcement thing that I got an email, and it, I looked over as I was reading. <laughs> I got to the K and E, and looked over, and it just went. Oh, I must be an N at the end of that. Keith, <laughs> if you have an LG OLED, uh, a 2017 C7 in Keith's cage, uh, case, what are the best picture modes to use as your starting point? He's interested in settings for a dark room, and he'll have SDR, HDR10, and Dolby Vision content. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. I want to speak generally. Because mm-hmm. we've talked about this, and maybe I think I feel like this question it comes up later in this question, or maybe later on. But generally speaking, these days, a lot of displays, especially anything that you any kind of higher end display, has some sort of theater or cinema mode. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you set that mode on, and then you look at if they give you a color temp thing. And they and it's like if it doesn't already set it to like warm or warm to or mm-hmm. something like that, uh, set you set that to that. It usually will do it automatically. You're usually very close to being correct. Right now, the OLEDs in particular, and I don't remember if the 2017 is the case. Rob's going to tell us in a second. Uh, some of these, especially when you're de- dealing with HDR versus SDR content, uh, can be a little different because it's a brand new technology yeah. and these first couple of iterations of if you don't think of yourself as an early adopter hate to break it to you you're an early adopter <laughs> because these hdr is still in its infancy and it hasn't really been uh completely uh formalized as far as how they do they're getting these displays out as fast as they can so in the future i think it's still going to be the case theater mode, you know, for a dark room or cinema mode and making sure the color t- temperatures are warm or something along those lines is usually going to be very close to being correct with very little adjustment past that. In this particular case, I'm not sure. So Rob, hit him up with the with the, with the the deets. Sure, yeah. And he did say this is for a dark room and that's important. Um, so on the 2017 LGs, uh, they do have for your standard dynamic range, ISF picture modes. And if your television has an ISF or a THX picture mode, that is almost certainly going to be the best setting for a dark room. And that is what they're meant for. Now, in the case of these, they have an ISF, and it is labeled ISF dark room and ISF bright room. (laughs) So that's a little bit self-explanatory, and it it is exactly, and mostly what they're changing there is the gamma setting, which makes sense. That's the rate of rise from dark to light in the bright room setting. Uh, they set a lower numerical gamma, which means that it raises a little bit more quickly from dark to light, which makes sense when you have more ambient light. In the dark room setting, it's a higher numerical value of gamma, which keeps it a little bit darker, a little bit longer. But in a dark room, you still see all the details. So ISF dark room is what you'd want as your starting point for SDR. Then for both HDR10 and Dolby Vision, you do just want the one that's called cinema mode. And again, mm. the cinema mode is for a dark room. It is keeping that um, the, the gamma tracing, in this case, exactly on the PQ curve, the perceptual quantizer electro-optical transfer function. That is, again, the fancy way of saying the rate of rise from dark to light, but it's spelled out specifically. It's like this value means exactly this many nits when it comes to right. HDR or Dolby Vision. And the cinema modes hold to that curve very accurately. So in a dark room, which is what that's meant for, that's what you want to use. But both of them, again, offer, I think they call it Cinema Home, which is for a brighter room, and it tracks not quite exactly along that PQ curve. They brighten it up a little bit, meant for a brighter room. So dark room, you want to use Cinema for HDR10 and Dolby Vision and ISF dark room for SDR. Right. All right, so most of the reviews and places that list picture settings seem to indicate that unless you have measurement equipment, there's not much point to adjusting the white balance or color management controls. It's true. Uh, Furthermore, most places seem to suggest that turning all of the optional picture enhancement type settings off and pretty much leaving all the other settings at their defaults. So is it really just as simple as selecting the correct picture mode and that's it? Or are there any specific settings that he ought to adjust in order to get the best image in a dark room? Okay, so... Yes, all of the things you just said are true. Yeah, it's you can't buy eye professional professional calibrator can't buy eye 
adjust white balance and do color management and just look at it and get it right. Yeah. They need measurement I mean, equipment. You to do can it right. guess, or, but you're probably going to do make it worse. <laughs> so. Right. I mean, you need something, and, and yeah. I mean, at the very at the, at the very least, what you need a test pattern to look at, and I mean, you can set brightness and contrast and that sort of thing with a test with the correct test pattern, which you can get some from things like the old THX movies that would have a mm -hmm. THX. Uh, some test patterns they would put up there for you but as far as getting the color balance i mean they used to have to put on remember, the blue glasses or whatever it yep. was the different color glasses and i mean that was really just to set the color and tint controls it still wasn't to adjust yeah. your individual red green and blue uh values in your in your white balance or in your color management system it was still the color management system thing. you absolutely 100 percent have to have a yeah, light color management system do. do not do not even touch it unless you have measurement equipment the yeah. the white balance uh they give you the option in the lgs of having just a two point so it just gives you a high point and a low point right and if you like if you're and it's it's unit to unit so you can't even look at somebody else's settings and go oh i'll try that because it varies unit to unit some have a little bit too much blue in the bright section a little bit too right. much red in the dark section but then it could be completely flipped on just uh, the exact same model but just a different unit it's just unit to unit variation so you really can't set that if you if you notice you're like everything obviously looks too blue in bright whites and you go, okay, maybe I click that down a few. You know, I mean, you're not going to, it's not going to destroy anything. You can always put it back. It's just a user control. But other than that, you don't really touch those unless you have a measurement meter. So he also asked about the enhancement type settings, yeah. like your, you know, uh, mosquito control yeah. or your, your noise uh, reduction, noise your reduction, 120 contrast. hertz. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I, I, I want to direct you because people I think are a little bit more familiar with receivers. So okay. in receivers, you will get DSP modes, right? Where mm -hmm. it's like rock arena or uh, all channel stereo or something like that. But when you're watching a movie, you know, you know, you normally people know to put on the straight decoding because that's the way you get the best experience. Anything past the straight decoding or just decoding with some up mixing. If, you, if you're watching a DVD and you want to get the app, an app most experience. Anything beyond that, you're just adding a bunch of stuff to it that it doesn't need and that is going to mm -hmm. mess up, quote unquote, mess up the listening experience. That's the same thing with these enhancements. These enhancements are made for very specific situations where you want or need something that in most view, home viewing experiences you don't need. You do not need to have all this edge enhancement on because you're not displaying this display in a you know extremely brightly lit room with uh, it on full mode and you're trying to make it look brighter and sharper than everything next to it from 20 feet away, okay? You're in your own home and you, you're sitting with a reasonable distance and everything else. So these enhancement modes, Really, first of all, they're just checkmark boxes on the side of why is, is my ha my TV has more things than your TV, therefore it must be better. That's part of it. But mostly it's for very specific use case situations that you're not encountering. So that's why they tell you to turn it off. Yeah, in terms of being uh, as true as you can be to the original signal, you have all of that stuff turned off. Um, so, I mean, uh, there is one setting in particular that is specific to the 2017 LG OLED. So we're really drilling down, but I mean, that's specifically what Keith was asking about. Right. And that is when it's an HDR10 signal, you definitely want to at least try setting the dynamic contrast, which is hidden beneath the expert controls on low. Right. And that's specifically because that is where LG hid their active HDR, which is their version of taking an HDR10 signal and analyzing it frame by frame and adjusting the tone mapping frame by frame. That's something they're doing on their own. It's not inherent to HDR10. It's pseudo turning HDR10 into dynamic a version of HDR. And they hid it beneath the dynamic contrast control on the 2017s. On the 2016s, they didn't have that. And on the 2018s, they gave it its own separate little menu item. So there it's you know. specifically to the one that Keith has. The other one on LG televisions is I would check the true motion settings. That's their frame interpolation settings. Now, thankfully, on the cinema modes, they turn that off by default, which is fine. But you can also set it to the user mode and then just set both of the sliders so they have a de-judder and a de-blur slider. You set those both to zero, and that means it's not actually interpolating any new frames, but it does activate the 120 hertz refresh, 
which can make things look a little bit cleaner, a little bit smoother, especially like motion, right? It'll clean up if there's a little bit of trailing or anything like that because it's refreshing the panel uh, twice as fast instead of 60. Mm. It's refreshing it at 120 now. So like when you're showing 24 hertz, it's just showing each frame five times now. That's what it's doing. So you can do that. Uh, having it off is fine, but if you set it to user with both sliders down. But everything else, I mean, thankfully, if, and if you look through a bunch of reviews, um, when they show the out-of-the-box settings versus the post-calibration settings, uh, they're like, even out of the box, all of the errors are like below three, which is the visible threshold that's in terms of the colors, and everything else they've essentially got right if you use, it, if you use the right picture modes. So, uh, yeah, you're in good shape. Yeah. Mark. Mark's theater area is 13 by 28, but it's open to the rest of the house. So infinity square cubic quad feet. Yep. He was running an all clips 5.1 setup, and he added two pairs of uh, SVS prime elevation speakers as front and rear heights. Hearing the SVS speakers, as well as our many previous speaker recommendations, made him realize he'd like to get different speakers. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I want to say, to start off with, we don't not like clip speakers. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, look, lots of people have them. Lots of people like them. And I think they sound quite nice in a lot of setups. Yeah. So th that being said, you know, he's he's in a pretty small room. I mean, he's, you know, it's not that Fairly small that space. Big. Yeah. Yeah, space. Theater area. And uh, he's not sitting that far away. So, <laughs> no. you know, there's, he's certainly got the option of getting a different speaker. All right, anyways, he managed to sell his Klipsch 5.1 setup for almost exactly what he bought it for originally. So now he has $3,300 for just his front three speakers, and it's burning a hole in his pocket. He's already <laughs> decided to use another pair of SVS Prime Elevation speakers as his surrounds, since their design works perfectly for him. So I guess we're looking at pictures of his old theater, and again, there is a wall on the That's left. Right. There's a wall on the left. There's no wall on the right. Uh, he's got his, uh, his TV on the stand. He's got... It looks like two subwoofers right on the outside of that stand, then two towers on the outside of that. His elevation speakers are above, and then I guess his elevation speakers. Well, I guess they're 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 in like the, fr the rear heights. So I, I yeah. guess he's going to put the 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 surrounds on the ceiling. Is that what his plan is? Uh, I think they're going <laughs> on the wall. Maybe they're going on the back wall because I mean on the on the for the surround right speaker, there's there's no wall to mount it to. But yeah. he's already got his existing surround speakers quite close to uh, what would be considered the back wall of his theater area. There's like a permanent opening that's actually right behind his seats, but um, there's wall on either side of that opening. Quite understand how he's going to do his right rear, his right surround speaker with the prime elevation speakers. It seems like he should just get. Uh, prime. I th yeah, I think he's. Yeah, I think he's going to mount it on that back wall and then have that angle, right? So, uh, yeah. so be angled towards his seat while mounted on the back wall. Whatever, it's already done. So, I guess yeah, we're apparently, not it's, apparently, get it's too happened. into that. Uh, yeah. So the two subs are up front, and there's no subs in the rear. It's no room treatments. There's an opening behind but, his head. But the, the subs, the uh, like those are gone. So <laughs> yeah. he sold the whole clips package. So. Right. Yeah. So the, there's no there's the opening behind uh, like a large. It's not a door. It's wider than a door, and it's opening behind the couch. So there's nothing right directly behind the couch to bounce any sound. But there's no room treatments on anything, and there's it looks like a. Maybe a, a, a window, it used to be a window into a kitchen on the mm -hmm. rear wall to the right of the theater area. And in front of that, across uh, on the front wall of his theater area, is a uh, uh, fireplace. So that's what mm -hmm. we got going on here. All right. Yeah, okay. So he not only wants his new front three speakers to sound better than his old Klipsch speakers, he also wants them to look nicer. And he's and since he's settled on the SVS prime elevation and surrounds as his front heights, uh, as surrounds and front heights, he'd, he'd clearly like the front three to have at least a decent timbre match with those as well. Uh, that being said, they will match pretty well with almost any speaker we ever talk about on this yeah. podcast Anything as a that's recommendation. a neutral speaker, yeah, yeah. yeah it'll be pretty good. So, so he says the SVS Ultra Series towers and centers are an obvious option, but thanks to our previous recommendations to other AV Rant listeners, he's also interested in the uh, Perian Varus 2 Grand Series, uh, uh, Grand Speakers, the Ascend uh, Sierra Series, or the Sierra 2s if he wants the Rao Ribbon Tweeters. Uh, otherwise, he'd have to go with the regular towers and Horizon Center to stay within budget. And mm -hmm. the Kef R Series and RBH Signature SV Series, although not the Signature Reference Series, since those would be over his budget. Realistically, he doesn't think he'd be able to audition all those in his house, so which two or three would be our talk recommendations to, for him to audition? Dude, put them, like, write them on pieces of paper, put them in a, bat, a hat, and then pick two <laughs> out. Hmm, no. Because, I mean, you, you literally could not go wrong with any of these, as far as I'm Agreed. concerned. Uh, 
I really I really like the Kef R series. I think that out of these, they would be not my first choice. I don't know that they okay. would be my last choice, but I don't know that they would be my first choice. Uh, the RBH, the Ascend, the Aperion, and the the SVS. I think the Aperion, the Ascend, and the RBHs are my top three, and the uh, the SVSs, which are great. I'm on, we're we're splitting hairs here, and the Kef series would probably be my bottom two. But literally, if if you pick two out of a hat and said <laughs> I got I got SVS and Kef, I'd be like, good. That's I mean, those are good. Logistically, I would have you get the SVS and the Aperion simply because free two way shipping. shipping. Yeah. So, yeah. in terms of and then pick one more. That's what I would do. Yeah. In terms of cost risk, really no reason. Now the Aperions, in my opinion, I mean, well, I guess the RBHs also have that nice curved, and they have different uh, finish options right. on the RBH Signature SV series. But the Aperions have you know the different finish options. If you don't want black, at least there is <laughs> a different right. option with the nice curved cabinets, uh, really nice speakers, and again the free two way shipping. It makes that a, a pretty easy one to choose as an audition. Um, if there's one that's different here, it would be like the Sierra 2s because that's the yeah. only one that's got a ribbon tweeter out here. I mean, perhaps you you literally get a single Sierra 2, just the center, uh, because then the price of returning it, return shipping, is pretty minimal. Um, and it would sure. give you the opportunity to hear the one speaker out of these that has a, a significant design difference from any of the others. Uh, and it is the nice bamboo cabinets with lots of finish options too. So in terms of yeah. looks, uh, really I'm going to nice make a, options there. a recommendation here too. I think you should not get tower speakers. Mm. And the reason is, is you're sitting very close to your speakers mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. it is, and you do not need the base out of them to get this yeah, you, don't, you going. certainly don't need towers in terms of an output capability situation here. So that saves you some money right there, except you will have to buy uh, stands, but mm -hmm. you have stands. Mm. They're oh, currently yeah, being the used in the back of the room. So you've got those stands, so you're, you're not, you don't yeah. have to buy the stands. So if it were me, I would be looking at bookshelf speakers mm. from any of these manufacturers, yeah. same series that you're talking about, but that could save you some money and then you could maybe bump up to this, the the uh, the reference series from RBH or the Rile tweeters. We are no help. We're like, all of these are great. Here's all nope. sorts of reasons to try any of them. All of them. <laughs> or them all. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get the bookshelves from the Sierra 2s, then, you know, the bookshelves are a lot smaller than the towers, yeah, yeah, you know, and then yeah. it makes sh return shipping easier. You know, I'm not, hey, honestly, okay, this is, this is what, when I'm in a situation like this where I'm like, everything sounds fantastic, a lot of times what I'll do and I can't make my mind up is I will, I will say heads, it's, you know, yeah. it's ascend, tails, it's RBH, I'll flip a coin and then I'll look at it and, and, and if I'm disappointed... Like, if my initial reaction is disappointment, I know that I really did have an opinion. If it's not, mm, then, yeah. you know, because that's the way I kind of feel about these is I, I feel like you literally could buy any of them, which, in which case, exactly. go with your gut. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you came back to us and said, these are the ones I went with out of the ones that you've mentioned, we'd be like, awesome. Like, there's not yes. a single one where we go, oh, that's kind of too bad. No, we'd be super happy. <laughs> just, you really like, should have talked to us first. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he did. And we're saying, no matter what you go with, we're going to give you a big thumbs up. I mean, yeah, yeah. his old speakers were black rectangles. Um, yeah. So if there's any out of these, like the Kef R series, very nice looking, but they're still just rectangles. Black rectangles, yeah. yeah. Uh, the SVS speakers, really nice looking, but they're still just rectangles. So yeah. if you want any that look a little bit different, those would the be Aperion. the Aperion Varus, the RBH, and then the Ascends are rectangles, but they are that nice actual bamboo with the cool finish options. So yeah. looks-wise, you can get something different there. So I'm kind of leaning towards those three if it's the combination of looks and, ev and everything else, right? And uh, yeah. There you go. All right. There, I nailed it. I, I narrowed it down to my three. Okay. <laughs> but definitely try the appearance. Free two-way shipping. Separate from his speaker budget, he's got around $1,800 to spend on subs. Given the fact that his room is open to the rest of the house, he was considering dual HSU VTF3 Mark V HP subs since they're the lowest, uh, one of the lowest priced high output subwoofers that allowed him to get two, uh, and, and that would allow him to get two within his budget. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, with this room being open, maybe a single SVS PB4000 would be best. What do we think? 
I think that PB4000 is a freaking huge ass sub. <laughs> you have it a hard is. time putting it in this room. <laughs> That's what I think. Um, I mean, you're not wrong. I, <laughs> output wise, one of them will probably do ya. But, uh, uh, I mean. Yeah, to me, I want the dual subs. <laughs> I, I yeah, you see, I have a hard time with dual subs and open concepts. Because... Plus, it does. He's probably going to end up with them both at the front of his room. That that right. is seems like it's going to be the most likely thing. So, Although you can still play with the phase knob and yeah. and get some pretty good results. It's going to be a, a lot of time and a lot of trial and error, but it can be done. I don't know. I I could I. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> gonna put my I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say the. PB 4000. Really? Wow. Look yeah. at this. What I a am. day. Mark this day down on your calendar, folks. This is the day when a host of AV Rant said Didn't that they two subs with the, well, the one big. The one yeah. Big one and the I, I think the reason is because if you're going to end up with both of them at the front of your room, anyways, mm. then I, you know, what, what, <laughs> it's just not going to make that much of a difference, I don't think. I think that you can play with the face knob yes. on the single sub. You know, the 4000's got, like, the app control or whatever it's yeah. got. And, you know, it'd be easier to do it from your seat. I don't know. I, I, I like What if he idea. waits for the new 3000 series and gets two of those? Well, okay. Well, I mean, never. I mean, I don't know how big those things are going to be. I honestly <laughs> don't, don't think he can fit two of the uh, HSUs up front. Based on the space mm. I'm seeing. Well, we're I'm, we're suggesting you go with uh, with bookshelves though. That might give them just enough room. I was thinking about that, and I'm still thinking he can't fit two of them up front. Or maybe, maybe they end up being his stands. Yeah, but we've heard horror stories of people trying yes. to do that, and then the 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 cabinet does vibrate a little it does, bit, and yeah. it will shake your little. Mm, I I can't off. I can't get away from having the two subs. I can't get away from it. And plus, those HSUs are so nice. The VTF threes are. Oh, really, they are really good subs. I can't I can't get away from the two subs. I can't do it. See, I see I see that this having two possible locations within this. I mean, uh -huh. within this room, it's on the it's on the left in the corner or the right yeah. next to the next to the fireplace uh, fireplace so at least with the single sub he's got the option of kind of moving it around a little bit now if you're going to tell me that you will then place one of those subs someplace other than the front of this room then i say go with the two subs okay but if you're not if you're just going to shove them back where, right where they were i'm more in favor of you just having wow. one big one i know we I, this is not the first time i've said that Rob. i know i've said this before it's just rare we have been so fair. little help to Mark, but we, I'm, yeah, we Mark. basically talked through all the things I'm sure hey. he already thought himself. <laughs> www.avrant.com slash buy us a cup of coffee link. So, you know, <laughs> we hooked you up, you hook us up. No, oh, uh, that's not the way that we could, could not have been less help. I actually think the bookshelf, I mean, I think he's going to be like, bookshelves? No, 100% bookshelves he was already told me he was already like sierra twos could, could could do that so it was yeah. it was in the back of his mind all right now put it in your front of your mind it's now that since we've not helped him let's go on to not help brent brent on twitter brent had a contractor finish the room brent will be using as his theater the drywall is up and completed but it turns out that one of the surround speaker wires was not run inside the wall <sighs> that's when you talk to your contractor say hey dude put, you don't get on. the rest of your money come until on. this is done yeah well i mean honestly I'm going to be honest with you, Brent, and I know what this 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 question is, but I think the solution to this problem is to call your contractor and say, "Listen, you didn't run the wire. I yeah. need it run to this place right here. Here's you know here's some links to some flat wire. Send over a drywall guy. Mm, mm. Have them install the wire, you know, and uh, run it, you know, underneath the carpet or wherever, you know, along the wall, back to my home theater, you know, to the place where it's supposed to have been in the first place, you know." the painting and stuff it's minimal expense on their part that's true yeah and uh it doesn't require them to open a wall you're not mm. saying you have to open the wall to do this you're just saying hey use this flat speaker wire make it look nice and that's that's literally a couple hours work for somebody who knows what they're doing they have to come back a couple of times which will be a hassle because you have to wait for the the yeah, and stuff to dry there. and they got to paint it again yeah. yeah but yeah we're talking about uh, yeah the very very flat speaker wire that you can't get yeah. i like the uh, ghost wire from sewell yeah. Um, so it's it's exceedingly flat. You can, in fact, just fold it on itself to make, you know, turns, 90 degree turns or whatever you need to do. And then you've got these flat ends that kind of go into these, um, I don't know, pseudo adapters, little little right. bracket things. And that just converts it into regular speaker wire to actually connect to your speaker. So, um, you know, all on its own. It's uh, it's not that visible, but it would still be visible. But you can do a light coat of wall 
plaster right over top of it, paint it. You can paint it directly, but if you want it to be truly invisible, you do just a light coating of, uh, of you know, wall plaster over it, paint over that, and it's it's gone. It's invisible. So, right. yeah, that, that is a solution. Um, you, you could certainly look into that. It was it was my first thought as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, so rather than cutting things open, is there a small wireless solution he could use uh, for that one surround speaker? Well, remember, wireless is not wireless. I mean, it's you still you have to plug it power in. Power cord. Yeah. Yeah, you got a power cord. So I really think that the 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 flat speaker wire is the way to go in this situation. Especially if, as we say, your contractor should should do it. They should do it for free. I yeah. mean, they should just like make it right. But I mean, yeah. if they don't, then you know, tell all your friends and review them on Yelp or whatever. But what do you got for a wireless <laughs> amplifier? Yeah, so I mean, for this type of thing, I'd, I'd point you to Amphony. Um, okay. Amphony, uh, they're Model 1700 in this case. Uh, so they have a uh, couple of different ones. The 1700 is a... So the wireless receiving part of it, which would you, you would put close to the speaker, it has an amplifier built right into it. So it's sure. a wireless receiving device and an amplifier. The 1700 just has one amplifier. It's a stereo amplifier, so you could actually connect two speakers to it. He only needs it for one. Sure. Uh, the model 1800 gives you two separate receiving devices, a little amplifier in each one. That's really nice if you got you know, like an open back of the room and you sure. need you know, a wireless amp, <clears throat> but it doubles the price. So the single unit one that is a stereo amp, it's 99 bucks. It's $200 for the dual one. Now, I like the Amphony ones because these ones have a speaker wire input on the transmitter device. So even if you don't have pre-outs on your AV right. receiver, you can still use this. That's what I like about that. That's and good. then on the little receiving unit, you just have speaker wire outputs and it has its own little volume knob. So... Yeah. I like that as a solution. Ninety nine bucks, not too bad. You can get them at Amazon, so you can return it if it doesn't work for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, what sort of latency would the Anthony wireless solution have? Sure enough for him to compensate just using the distance setting on his receiver. Uh, yeah, it's these things are fairly well designed, and once you once you run Odyssey or whatever you know room correction system you're yeah. doing when it does the room setup, it's going to account for this. It, it's going to detect that there's some latency there, and it's just going to change the distance settings on probably most of the rest of the speakers to be honest with yeah. you, to get <laughs> no, them to, 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 to match up. It's it's usually about uh, 20 milliseconds, uh, yeah. which which is about 20 feet extra in the yeah. distance setting. Your auto setup will take care of that and uh, it should not be a, any problem at all. Uh, one last little comment was, uh, Brent was the guy, do you remember, uh, he was <clears> the guy who had the golf simulator that was going to be part of his uh, his basement set up does that Dolph? ring any bells oh for you? right right yeah. right 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 yeah, yeah. so he, he just he mentioned in his email that he does use it all the time we were like oh I, we're you're gonna put that thing in and, and use it once and probably he's like nope i use it every day so oh so, good, so on, you, good buddy. on you brent that's good that was that was worth it in that case well yeah and that's <laughs> exactly it I've, I've seen so many i mean so my parents have an elliptical machine, mm -hmm. right? And elliptical machines are famous for being very good things to hang clothes from because that's what most people do for them. Yep. But my brother, who's <laughs> autistic, exercises on it twice a day, every oh. day. Bur he's burned through like three of them so far. Oh, I mean, wow. He just straight up destroys them. He'll do like 30 minutes in the morning and 50 minutes in the evening mm. every single day. So... Yes, most people, an elliptical machine is a money hole that you just threw away some money <laughs> on. But for him... And my parents, it's not. And in Brent's yeah. case, it wasn't as well. So that's great. I'm glad you enjoy your uh, golf simulator thing. If I lived, if I like golf, I would love a golf simulator because I hate being outside. Mm. All right, Alvin. <laughs> Alvin enjoyed our explanation about how one speaker driver can reproduce multiple instruments and voices simultaneously. But we mentioned that we were simplifying the explanation a bit by only taking uh, uh, talking about one single driver moving back and forth. Obviously, most speakers have that we buy have two, three, or more drivers, so it's some sort of crossover between them. So how does that all work with the whole many individual sine waves can just be added together to create one complex sine wave situation? Well, the way the crossover works is it takes the incoming signal, and either through an active means using DSP or a passive means using the, the resistors and all the other stuff that's inside Capacitors the Capacitors and inductors, yep. That are inside there. It takes the frequencies and splits, basically, if you think about it this way, it, it, you're sending it to all everything, but the 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 components inside the the crossover is blocking some of them from e each one of the drivers. So in the case of the tweeter, it's blocking off everything lower than whatever you know. It's not brick wall, but you know it's blocking the number of frequencies below that and above. Uh, for the mid range, it's going to be above and below. Mm -hmm. And even if, if there's multiple drivers doing the same job, they're all getting the same frequencies you know they're all getting the same information they're all moving back and forth but 
and, and we'll get to the second part of his question later. So yeah, so yeah. basically that's what the crossover is doing is it's the same information, you know, the that that you would be sending to a single driver, except it's just being split out over multiple drivers. Yeah, I think I think he's he's more on the conceptual level trying to imagine. So we talked about so you have this this one single complex wave that contains. Right all the sounds that we're hearing from whatever given recording. And in fact, in real life, just out in the world, it's a complex wave in the air that is hitting our eardrum. And that's that's conveying all the sounds that we might be hearing at any given instant. So he's like, okay, uh, now that one complex wave, we divide it into two or three or four or whatever, however many drivers, that complex wave is now divided that many times and, and duplicated that many times and sent to all those drivers. But then we're saying... But this driver isn't playing that entire complex wave. It's only playing right. a portion of it. How does that work? Well, you send it. So if we think about the very simplest crossover, a first order crossover, where it's only attenuating at a rate of six decibels per octave, that can literally be for the tweeter. So you're rolling off the low frequencies. That can be a single capacitor. That can be your first order crossover piece of equipment that makes that happen and on the woofer so if we're talking about a two-way speaker like a bookshelf speaker on the woofer you're attenuating the high frequencies and that can literally be one inductor and that can be it so the same complex wave is being sent to both of those devices when it goes through the capacitor that is uh so the capacitor it's a what we it's like a uh, a damper you could almost think of it as it's going through yeah, it's, I mean, it's absorbing that, some of the energy. Right, right. If I think of it, I, I always think of capacitors like sponges. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it kind of as you soaks pass it, it up through, and you can wring it back out. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, exactly. So it soaks. It soaks up. In, in this case, it's soaking up more of one part of the frequency than than. Well, other the ones. the reason it ends up attenuating the lower frequencies is because that's where most of the energy in the signal is. The higher frequencies have less energy. So as it's absorbing energy, percentage wise, it's absorbing more from the low frequencies than it is from the high frequencies. So it's essentially letting through more. It, it's attenuating everything, but right. but uh, what comes out the other end is. Uh, more of the high frequency energy is still present as a percentage of its original amount uh, versus the lower frequencies. So that ends up lowering it. So if you're thinking about what happens to that original complex wave, it's just shrinking it <laughs> in amplitude, but the lower frequency part of that ends up getting shrunk a little bit more. than right. So it changes, uh, it doesn't change the entire complex wave, but it just alters the peaks and dips and the parts that are due to the low frequencies get attenuated a little bit more on the inductor side it's kind of a simple uh, a similar thing so that is uh the inductor is taking the original signal and it's actually inducing that same uh signal uh, on a like you could think of it as two wires next to each other the original signal is coming through the first wire and it's causing that same signal to flow through the second wire without the signal originally being sent through the second wire. So it's inducing the same current in the wire next to it. And that has the opposite result, which is that the sm the lower power high frequencies can't induce themselves into that second wire as much as the higher power low frequencies. So percentage wise, you have less high frequency versus the low frequency in the inductor. So again, that complex wave goes in and what comes out the other end of that inductor is a slightly different shape where the high frequencies have now been reduced uh, compared to the low frequencies. So the same signal goes in, but a slightly different signal comes out of the other ends and then gets fed to the two different drivers. But the two different drivers still just know to move back and forth in response to that signal. It's and exactly I, the same. I, I think maybe part of this question stems from, well, how come, you know, how do you get these two drivers that are getting different signals how do they sound good together? And mm -hmm. therein is the speaker where the speaker designer comes in. They are not just looking at specs on a spec sheet and saying, "Well, this dry, this will work well with this." No, they're putting things together and they're listening to how they interact with each other. You know, when it when a frequency sweep goes from one driver to the other, how well does that meld together? How close do I have to have them be together? What you know, what points? Uh, where in the the front baffle should this the, the tweeter be in relation to the woofer? Do the woofer and the tweeter work well together as far as where their roll off points are? Are we seeing any dips in that frequency response? And just timbre matching the the tweeter and the the woofer as well. There is a lot of that that goes on. And yeah, <clears throat> that's why you can't. That's why whenever somebody says, "Well, I'm going to take the 
you know, aluminum dome tweeters out of my uh, out of my whatever speakers, and I'm going to put in some Rao ribbon tweeters. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it'll you know, still it, make it, sound. But it'll yeah. make sound, but it'll be it won't be right. And then you will. And, and the reason is is because it's it's more than just the component. It's, there's yeah. a lot of design that goes there. Yeah, yeah, again, conceptually, you can think, so the original complex wave, one of them goes <clears throat> into the speaker, gets divided into however many, let's just say a two-way, because that's easier to describe, uh, gets divided. So what comes out of the crossover is two slightly different complex waves. But then when the tweeter and the woofer produce those two now slightly different complex waves, remember, now we just add those two complex waves back together again and you're hoping that what comes out is the same as what originally went in now. So it kind of went in, divided in two, got a little bit changed, comes out as two, but when we put those two back together, we're hoping we get the original back. Right. And And you can just just add waves together. The drivers, you know, match in some way is, you know, you might be playing the fundamental with the woofer, but the harmonic is in the tweeter. Mm-hmm. So you you can't just assume that, oh, this, dr- this woofer can play this fun- this this note, so therefore it'll be fine because it's the, the fundamental has to match or the, the speaker's going to sound off. Yeah. So there's that. All right, we, we can do this forever. Let's do something else. Uh, <laughs> he asks, if the single complex wave that is sent to any given speaker can broken down into individual sine waves, would the, quote, ideal, unquote, be to have a separate driver for each and every individual sine wave with a brick wall filter above and below that single frequency? Then each driver would only have to move back and forth at one single frequency, right? Uh, so would the perfect speaker have 20,000 drivers? If you followed well, that logic, you would have an infinite number of drivers right, because right. it's not just like we go in one hertz increments from right. zero to 20,000. There's every decimal point in between yeah. at an infinite range. So it's it's fully variable. <laughs> so I this w- logic wouldn't allow you to have to... doesn't allow you to do that, yeah. But I mean, you can look at something like a line array, which okay. a line array is very is a very small driver. They don't move very much. But there's a whole bunch of them all playing but they all do the same thing <laughs> they all do the same thing right yeah, so this is it. this is the, this is not being divided but you're seeing what you're basically trying to do is create a single large driver essentially that is moving the air in the way that it was originally moved yeah if that I makes mean, sense the when you're thinking what would the ideal be the ideal is the polar opposite the ideal is one driver and actually one driver with zero that mass. is it like a mathematical <laughs> point <laughs> that yet somehow manages to still couple and move the air, right? right? Which is impossible. But we're talking about what yeah. would the theoretical ideal yeah. be? It would it would be one driver because then it is just moving in response to the signal. You're not right. having to divide the signal at all. Right. But in real that's in real ideal. world terms, in real mechanics, it's hard well, to create you're one driver. <laughs> You know, you're, the, the air, the, you have a single driver in your ear. Yeah. It's yeah. essentially going back and forth. What you want is a single driver out in the air that can move the air so that it moves your ear the exact same way as it yeah. did before. That is just something that is not possible to do uh, because you're not just dealing with a single point of reference. You know, sounds are coming from multiple places. So, I mean, it would, anyways. <laughs> A, like like Rob said, impossible. But it would be nice if you know. I mean, zero there are ones that try. We, we, yeah. we have single single driver speakers, but uh, yeah, they, yeah, they, like they don't work. Yeah. <laughs> not, not ideally, anyway. Headphones, Headphones yeah, because then you don't have to move the air very much. Yeah. Steve. Steve has a fairly small theater with a permanent opening on the right side that goes into his dining room. Boy, today is all about the open concept. It open is concept, about the open it? rooms, yeah. yeah. He tried surround back speakers for a while, but this seat is quite close to the rear wall. He found that they just sort of smeared and blurred the rear sound effects. So we went back to using five speakers. Dude, welcome to my world. I did the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I think I was sitting even further away from my back wall than you are right here. So um, if we're looking at this... Uh, Again, a left side wall is there. Uh, there's a door in the back, the rear, the rear left hand the, of the room. So projector up on the ceiling and a very like smack up against the back wall. There's a, a one surround speaker. It looks like is on a stand. Is that right? No, uh, it's a, no there's a half both, wall. They're there. both on the walls. Yep. They're wall mounted to the left and right of the couch, and then there's up front. He's got what looks like I'm going to say paradigms or PSPs. I can't really tell. Oh, um. I think they're paradigms. They look like paradigms. Maybe maybe monitor audio? Could be monitor Kinda audio. Kind of looks yeah. a bit like monitor speakers. Yeah. Not really consequential. One We're couch just... almost all the way against the wall, and then there's an opening to the right side, uh, like one and a half doorways wide that uh, opens into, I guess that's a dining room. Maybe. A dining room, he said. Yeah. Permanent yeah. opening in any case. 
Then he installed front heights for Atmos using SVS Prime Elevation speakers on the front wall. He cannot honestly say that he's been all that impressed, but he's willing to try a 5.2.4 setup regardless. And now he's just trying to figure out where to position the rear pair of overhead speakers. Okay. So I just want to say, we talked about this and, you know, don't be surprised if you're like, oh yeah, they're up there every once in a while. Nope. I watched all of Deadpool 2 and went, nope. Ah. <laughs> the the bass in Deadpool 2 was kicking though. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. that's fine. But uh, the, the I, I never once noticed them. And I was, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so his first thought is put another pair of prime elevation speakers directly above his side surround speakers, essentially uh, surround heights. Uh, though he called them top middles installation wise, that would be easiest for him. His other option would be to put them on his rear wall, but there's a jut in, in for a door on his uh, rear left corner, so they'd either be unevenly spaced or they'd be closer together than his front height speakers. Also, since his experience with surround backs on his back wall was displeasing, he's hesitant to put speakers on his back wall again. Though those would be higher up than his former surround backs, where what do we think? What position will work best? I think above the surround speakers is just fine. Yeah, um, I do think that's fine. Um, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I guess they, yeah, if, if you evenly spaced them on that back wall so that they're inside of the, the little jut in for the doorway, they, they would be like just to the sides of his couch, right? That that's, yeah. looks like what, where they would end up being. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, I mean, honestly, he said the easiest for him to install is high up on the side walls right above basically as right. surround heights. That settles it for me. I'm like, yeah. Well, yeah. If, if that's the easiest I, I, to install, then do that. I am I am with you there as well. I mean, there's yeah. no reason to make this more difficult than it needs to be, number one. But number two, I mean, that's kind of where they're supposed to be. In the, that's kind of how SVS envisioned right. their, their elevation Yeah, as top to middles. Used. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, again... Don't be surprised if you don't notice anything fantastic. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, if, I, if you... I keep looking for the... the Buy the Jurassic Park 4K. Yep. Buy the Jurassic... That's, and then watch the first five minutes of it and say... And if you do not like walk away going, oh, yeah, that made a big difference, then you just, just, just return just watch everything. watch that over and over and over. <laughs> I do right. still like John Wick and Atmos. I don't have John Wick and Atmos. Yeah. Is it Blu-ray? Does the Blu-ray have Atmos? Yes. As well as the Ultra HD Blu-ray version, which I'm going to have to watch it there. again then, because I don't think I've seen it since. Maybe yeah. I haven't seen it since then. I don't know. All right, how much time do we have left? Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Carlton has an original Velodyne HGS15 subwoofer from almost 20 years ago. It might be old, but it's a beast. Basically, a sealed 18-inch cube with a 15-inch driver and a 1,250 watt amp servo-controlled amplifier. It can genuinely. This is back when Velodyne made like serious subwoofers. They have. They. They. <laughs> I mean, they still of, do. They. Kind of. They're not whatever. the only dedicated yeah. subwoofer in town game anymore yeah. like they were 20 years ago, though. This was probably really pricey when you bought it, too. Yeah. It can generally play down to 18 or 19 hertz, and it was the first piece of really nice home theater equipment Carlton ever owned. His wife jokes that she married him because of his subwoofer, and he says he married her because she actually likes subwoofers. <laughs> They're moving, <laughs> and the folks buying their place want to keep their existing home theater. Carlton's happy to buy all new stuff for their place, but his Valadine sub holds some sentimental value, so he's making uh, that's making him want to keep it. Mm-hmm. Is it still a great sub by modern standards? Would he be getting a way better performance if he replaces it with a new sub, enough to make parting with its sentimental value worthwhile? Now, How big I is did, your new room? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> there's, there's that question to be answered for sure. Like, where are you going to be putting this thing? Yeah. And is, is it going to be appropriate for your space? So let's pretend, because we don't know. Let's pretend that, that the new space, this is an appropriate sub. Okay. Okay. So if we say that, when we look at the sub, do we think, oh, no, you should buy this other sub because it's much more linear and it's much this and more that and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I am of the opinion, at least with this Elodyne, that even though I didn't really go and try to find any sort of measurements on it, which I probably should have done. But my my initial thought was you should keep it. You mm-hmm. should take it with you. And I think any sort of real linearity pro- problems that you might have with it can easily be solved with your brand new AV receiver, which will have... Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Odyssey. No, so. uh, Audioholics uh, reviewed the the update version of this. So there was an HGS uh, 15X, I think, because of course there's an X. Um, <laughs> there was an I version too, the I HS. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> Lowercase yes. I. But, uh, but no, I mean, a very favorable review on that. Uh, there's nothing in here to make me say that um, if a sealed 15-inch high-powered subwoofer uh, is appropriate for your room size... There's there's no performance reason 
that you right. that you must get rid of this Velodyne. None at all. Uh, the only reason that I would say that is if you're going to a much larger space or now it's a wide open room, which would be unfortunate, but then you might want to look at a much higher powered ported version because you're just going to need that kind of output. Yeah. But as long as the 15 inch seal design is something that will work in your new house, uh, yeah, yeah, keep that Velodyne. Man, if it's got sentimental value, there's there's no performance reason that you have to get rid of it. Man, I forgot to bring the card in, but I this makes me think about something. There is a place here in in uh, St. Petersburg, and it's called like the Speaker something. I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> Anyways, I'll find the, the card and we'll talk about it later. But uh, basically, all they do is speaker repair. Okay. So I drove, I've been driving by this place and I'm like, the speaker spot or whatever it is, or speaker something. And I, I went in, I was like, you know, and I looked around and it's nothing but like open drivers everywhere. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm yeah. like, what do you guys do here? Like, we repair speakers. Repair, like, man. That's it? And he goes, yep. That's what we do. I'm like, so people send you what drivers and they repair them? I'm like, he's like, yep. Okay, okay. So I mean, he don't really build speakers or anything. But they might, they might, you might send them a speaker and they're like, okay, this one's this driver's blown completely, mm -hmm. but we can replace it with this other one and that sort of thing. But if they were gonna like repair a speaker, it's about seventy five bucks. He said, just like to do a surround repair, sure, yeah, yeah, all that other stuff. So all you guys out there, I'll get the the card and we'll talk about it next week or something. But uh, I now have some place to send you. That that's basically oh, good, yes. all they do. So yeah, we yeah, yeah. put that in our repertoire of things that we talk about. This makes me think of this because I, I'm <laughs> going to get to his new house. Somebody's going to put a hand through that freaking woofer and he's going <laughs> to need it repaired. All right. So if he takes the Velodyne with him, he'll he'll want to replace it with uh, for the people buying their old place, which current which a currently available sub would be comparable, and which would physically fit since his HG S15 was perfectly uh, situated in his old setup. He probably built it around the sub. Maybe the available space is 18 inches wide. 20 inches deep and 19 and a half inches tall. So that's actually a pretty standard shape. I mean, I even think mm -hmm. an EP 500 fits in that, to be honest with you. That's uh, pretty yeah, close. Yeah, I think so. The only one, yeah. maybe the height, because some of them are like 20 or 21 inches tall. So yeah. maybe the height, but... Uh, I did not look up anything because I, I saw that you already had stuff looked up. Yeah, so well, I mean, like a 15 inch sealed sub um, and I'm like... I went right to HSU, right there, ULS 15 Mark II, uh, right. $800 will fit in these dimensions, and it's a nice, high-powered 15-inch sealed subwoofer. I, I can't think of anything much more comparable than that. Right. Um, also, Power Sound Audio has their S1510, uh, their sealed 15-inch, fairly high-powered, which also, uh, uh, dimensions-wise, will fit. A just just I think I think it is 19 and a half inches taller one of them was maybe it was the ULS uh with its feet so but a anyway those two are the ones I went imme to immediately and uh it should work unless they're too expensive I'm not sure but uh yeah he didn't mention that so <laughs> all right it's gonna roll in the price of the house anyways yeah Brandon Brandon had the Epson home cinema 3500 projector that was damaged by lightning strikes near his home, so he's looking to replace it. Now that we've seen the big announcements out of IFA, he's so he's just trying, trying to decide what to get. He has some light control, but he has light-colored walls, a white ceiling, and doesn't get some ambient light coming through the covers on his windows during the day. Excuse me, man. I have got to drink water with this coffee. I've got so much <laughs> sugar in it. I, I put too much sugar in it. It's like making my mouth like... <laughs> so it already has a 1.2 gain screen innovations, ambient light rejecting screen. It's 120 inches and he sits 10 and a half feet away. All right. So again, the left wall. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. So another left wall. This one is looks like sliding glass doors or maybe just a big window, but it doesn't look like it's ever used because there's a couch on the outside, which looks like it's a porch mm, out yeah. there. So he's got a gray ambient light rejecting screen mm -hmm. in front of him, two tower speakers, a, a, a furniture up front with the, the, the center channel on it, some home theater seating. Which looks like it's not on the back wall. There's no, there's no back. Definitely wall. not on the back wall. Yeah. So and there's tile, but he's got a, a big rug, which looks like it could be plusher, but it is a big rug in front of him, and no other room treatments. I don't see surround speakers. Uh, well, not in the images, but we're not really seeing behind the seats. So, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So his budget is set, such that if we were to go for one of the newly announced 4K projectors uh, from Sony or JVC, they would have to be in their entry level model. Uh, as yeah, the quote JVC. unquote. <laughs> right, right. The DLNA uh, N5 from JC, JVC or the Sony VW270ES. Uh, whatever that's in Europe. Or yeah, those are the North Europe America. model numbers. I'm yeah. sure they'll be different because they were the the previous <clears throat> ones had different model numbers between Europe and North America. So it's also the less expensive Epson to consider. He's mm -hmm. a projector for a mix of TV shows, games, and movies. What would we recommend? Oh, this is tough. 
I don't know, man. Uh, well, according to the AV Forum guys, the JVCs are better <laughs> the than the JVC. Sonys. And in this situation, it would make sense, actually, to go yeah. for the N5. Because uh, yeah. so... The ones they announced in Europe were the N5, the N7, and the NX9, the X because it can do 8K wobble version thing with the 4K chip. Those are the JVCs. But the N5 and the N7, very similar to the existing uh, models, um, the N5 doesn't have quite as deep, super deep black levels, although still really impressive and good black levels. And it doesn't have the uh, digital cinema color filter that goes into the light path and gives you the full wide color. But... It's a bit brighter, and since your room is never 100% dark, I mean, even if you have no light on at all, you still have light-colored walls and all that. Right. So going for the one that doesn't have the like ridiculously deep black levels but has a bit more light output actually totally makes sense. So the JVC N5, if you really, really want the full 4K resolution, but I'm thinking, what if you just get the existing X590? Right. Which costs considerably, like you can find that now for right around $3,000. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. And we, we, we talk about waiting for CDA to come out for the announcements mm -hmm, and everything mm -hmm, else. Mm -hmm. it, a lot of times I'm not waiting for the announcements to come out so that I can get the brand new thing. I'm waiting for the announcements to come out so that all the other things can go on sale. Go down in price. Yeah, and actually <laughs> so, JVC said they're keeping the 790 from yeah. the existing lineup. They're keeping that in the lineup because it's a super popular model. It's down to about $4,500 now. You know, it started out at, at 6000 but it's down yeah. to about 4500 retail, and you can sometimes find it even a bit less than that. It's got the crazy deep dark levels. It's got the cinema filter if you want it. It's just that it's the 1080p panel that's wobbled to do pseudo 4k and they're like yeah there's no reason to, it's their most popular model that they sell and yeah. they're not taking it out of the lineup because it's still less expensive than any of the new 4k models that they introduced now we haven't really even talked about the sony's or the epson's i mean the epson is still the value choice unquestionably right. there I, I if he says he plays games so mm -hmm. there, having the 18 gigabits per second input on the new Epson that just got announced, because the price didn't really go up all that significantly, in that case, I would look at the brand new one if you're going mm -hmm. with the Epson, because it would be nice to be able to play 4K at 60 hertz. Because sure. that's a thing you can do now. And you can't do that on the old model, old model. It was stuck at 30 hertz. So if you do go for the Epson, I would consider the new one there. But man, I'm really leaning towards like, not even an X790, because again, same same thing, right? You don't really need the super deepest black levels. You need the more light output, and the 590 could give you that for right around 3,000 bucks. There we go. Yeah. Finally saving somebody money around here. Yeah. <laughs> Chris. Chris says uh, he knows we've discussed Odyssey Dynamic EQ and Dynamic Volume before, but he appreciated a bit of a refresher on which settings we recommend for each of those options and why. Also, we don't seem to mention the reference level offset setting within the Dynamic EQ settings very often, and that setting is kind of confusing. So what should the reference level offset be, and what is it going and what is it doing to the signal? Mm -hmm. So first of all, Dynamic EQ and Dynamic Volume. Dynamic Volume attempts... Odyssey Dynamic Volume right. we're talking about, just to very clear, important. the Odyssey one, yeah. Dynamic volume's job is to keep the volume level relatively the same th across time. So you're watching TV and you're watching your show and you turn the volume to the right level so that you can hear the dialogue and then the commercial comes on and it's 10 dB louder and it blows you out of your seat. Mm -hmm. Dynamic volume's job is to stop that from happening. Okay, so it analyzes the signals and the peaks and everything like that and make sure that you're not getting uh, blown out of your seat. Yeah, it uh, is dynamic range compression. So yeah. the full dynamic range in a movie should be, I mean, at least 20 decibels. Right. And this is saying, nope. Not anymore. Now it's 15 or 10 or 5. And there are different settings, right? There's a low, medium, high in the dynamic volume. And that's more or less what it does. And it just says, nope, not the full 20 decibel range anymore. I'm going to shrink that down so that everything is closer to being the same volume all the time. So dynamic volume is what I like to call nap mode. Sure. So when you're running, you're going to want to take a nap and you don't want to be woken up by your TV screaming at you. You set dynamic volume volume to on to its highest level and then you set it to the, the volume you want it to be that's just loud enough to so that you can hear but not so loud that it's going to wake you up mm -hmm. and then you go to sleep any other time dynamic volume should be off agreed there's yeah. never never a case for it as far as i'm concerned i mean the only other option would be late at night and you have neighbors on an adjoining wall and you want to be able to hear everything 
you want to be able to hear the talking and the explosions, but you don't want the explosions to be 20, 20 dB decibels louder. louder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you can toggle these on and off on the fly. Um, you yeah. know, you don't, you don't have to rerun Odyssey every time you want to no. change between dynamic volume settings. So yeah, uh, it's totally fine to use it, but ideally you would have it off. So the dynamic EQ is uh, something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And by a little bit, I mean 100%, not even close to the same. So what does dynamic EQ do? Dynamic EQ, our perceptions of sound level or sound volume changes, I'm sorry, of sound intensity ba changes based on the volume. So mm -hmm. in the bass range in particular, as we lower the volume of the, of the overall volume of the bass, our perception of how loud it is actually goes down much faster. Yeah. So what this does is as we come from reference level, where reference level, we know that we perceive the, the bass to be this level and it is that level. As we lower off of reference level, our bass, our perception of bass goes way down very fast. So Rob will tell you the exact numbers. I, mean, I can't remember that stuff. But <laughs> uh, basically, you know, in order to keep us to uh, perceive the bass to be the same volume as it should be compared to all the other sounds, it actually brings up the volume of the bass slightly, depending on what volume you're at, so that it is perceptionally the same volume as the other sounds in the track. So this is done through the Fletcher Munson curves, and they also used uh, humans to go through and make adjustments to a uh, essentially a huge mixing board is what they told mm -hmm. us uh, as they changed the volume to make sure it all sounded right and they they took these sound design you know, sound engineers and stuff like that and D, I don't know, DJs maybe who who do I know and they uh, and they had them all say okay now make sure that the sound sounds balanced to you in the scene at this volume and they changed you know the different frequencies and they took all this information this data they created an algorithm so as you lower the volume. The master volume. The master volume. The the perceived volume of the bass and all the other frequencies stays relatively the same tw towards each other. So, yeah. dynamic EQ is something we like. Mm -hmm. We, it, but it will increase your base your bass volume at lower volume levels. So, if you are the one time you would not want to use it is when you've got your diamond. You, you know, you got you're worried about your neighbors or whatever. Yeah. And you want uh, to make sure that they're you know, your bass isn't going up crazy high. So you would maybe turn it off then or turn on dynamic volume at that point. Yeah, I mean, one way to think of it is that at full reference volume, dynamic EQ does nothing. Yeah. And it's only when you lower the volume that dynamic EQ comes into play. And it's to keep all the sounds audible. So like one of the figures that you do down at 20 hertz, uh, the bass needs to be, what is it, like about 80, 70, 80, 80, 80 decibels 80 or something decibels, like that, yeah, something just for us to even hear it. Any mm -hmm. quieter, and I mean, it's there. You can measure it, but we just don't hear it. That's just our human hearing if it's any quieter. So of course, if in the recording it was meant to be 80 or 85 decibels, and we can hear that at full reference volume, but then you're listening at minus 20, which you very well might be doing. Now it knocked that down to like 60 decibels or something, and you literally can't hear it. It is playing, but you can't hear it. So dynamic EQ makes it so you can still hear it. But then that means it's playing at the audible threshold, which might be like 80 decibels, which is still loud and maybe late at night when you don't want to bother anybody else. You don't necessarily want that on. Uh, but yeah, we like to have that on since most of us don't li listen at full reference volume. And that leads us right into what is that reference level offset? I don't know what that reference level offset is. Well, I, I think I do, but I'm not going to make a guess at it. Yeah, the settings are minus 5, minus 10, and minus 15. And all that's doing is it's saying, well, this is your new reference level. Reference level is normally zero. Right. Zero dB on the volume dial. And now it's saying, well, now your new reference level is minus 5. So I won't do anything to the signal at minus 5. It's only until you go down below minus 5 that I start to boost the bass and the surround effects and stuff to keep them audible. Or... I don't do anything all the way down to minus 10 on the volume dial, but then below minus 10, I start to boost mm -hmm. things up. And you might want to use that particularly for music recordings, which are not mastered to the same volume level as movies. Music recordings don't adhere to the movie reference volume level. So very often you'll get some recordings on CD or something like that that are significantly louder. Mm -hmm. uh, than a movie. Therefore, if you listen at full reference volume, you'd be blasting yourself with like 120 decibels or something. And you're saying, well... Thanks, Obvious Oasis. <laughs> yeah, obviously I want to turn that down on the master volume dial. At 0 dB, it's way too loud. But when I turn it down, dynamic EQ kicks in and starts boosting the bass. So it's way too loud, even at the comfortable level. Then you can set a reference level offset to say, don't do anything at minus 15 decibels. Don't do anything because that's actually correct. So that's what the reference level offset does. There you go. 
and if you're like me and you only ever watch video content in your home theater, just turning it on with zero is fine. There you go. Yeah. Francis on Facebook. He's got uh, sound format confusion. Francis has an LG E7 OLED and a Marantz uh, SR7010 receiver. If he uses the OLED's built-in Netflix app and he just uses the TV all by itself for its built-in speakers, with his built-in speakers, everything seems to play fine. Okay. But when he uses HDMI ARC for full surround sound from his uh, Marantz receiver, he gets short audio dropouts every 15 seconds or so, which is obviously very annoying. Could it just be a faulty HDMI cable or is it something else? Oh, it sounds like CEC. Mm, it, sa- it sounds like CEC. I don't think CC. so. I mean, I've, I've used this, I mean, almost this exact setup. So I have a B7 OLED instead of yeah. an E7. I have the exact same SR7010 receiver. I've actually done it with HDMI CEC on so that when I press the power button on one of them, the power goes off on yeah. both of them. I don't have this issue. Uh, so, and I'm using HDMI arc. So this, something cable, is faulty here. Yeah, the cable though? For every it, 15 second dropout? It sounds like it's uh, it's the handshake. It's re-handshake shaking. It does, but I so mean, often. that could be the cable. It, I mean, it can be as simple as a loose connection in one of the ports. Mm. That yeah. that can definitely cause this type of thing. I mean, we can't we cannot eliminate that it's the cable. We cannot eliminate right. that it's just the the plug that you're put. In fact, I think the most likely thing is that one of the ports is just a little bit loose, because uh, that's that's really really common. Uh, but it also could just be you know the the strain relief where the actual wires go into the plug on the cable right. itself. Some you bend that a few times, something comes a little bit loose. That seems quite likely. It could also be though the HDMI board in either of these devices. It, that's not impossible, uh, mm. unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's really tough to nail down exactly. But I mean, the easiest thing, of course, is to swap out the HDMI cable. That's the easiest and least expensive of these. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, I hate this type of troubleshooting, but yeah. what else can you do? Yeah. It's It could be the cable. It, I, it, I would suspect a port before anything else, like just a, a loose jiggly port. So he has an Xbox One S. If he sets its bitstream output to format to Atmos, every sound, regardless of the original source, comes from up as Atmos on his Marantz. Yes, it really? does. Really? Yeah. It doesn't really. Other than physi- I had, physical disks, I had it, it will switch. That. But I, had, I, had not, I had not noticed that at all. Uh, yeah. He says even the screensaver is uh, Atmos. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> It plays nothing in Atmos. You're getting silence. Is there anything that would be done about that? Yes, you can use a different device because that that's exactly <laughs> what there there is no but okay. We've discussed this multiple times, and yeah. Atmos right now it does all the deco- it takes whatever sounds you have, it decodes it, then re-encodes it into Atmos if you tell it to, and then bits bit streams it out as Atmos. Yep. Well, that means that every speaker in your system is being assigned sounds by the the Xbox One. No. Basically. And that Atmos sound is like, okay, yep, we're it, it was stereo when I got it. So I'll decode it into PCM and then recode it, re-encode it into Atmos using only the front <laughs> two speakers yep. to do it. And there's no way to not do it that way other than to set your receiver to, I mean, your uh, Xbox, you have to change it from time to time, mm-hmm. to PCM. Yeah. 5.1 PCM. And then uh, send it out that way. You want to know yeah. what I've resorted to? What? I have Not my Xbox... using the Xbox One. <laughs> I, no, I have my Xbox One output stereo. Yeah, I have it output stereo because then I can upmix it yeah. using DTS Neural X or or uh, Dolby Surround upmixer, uh, which does a terrific job because yeah. whatever the original one was, whatever the original sound source was, that all gets down mixed actually very nicely into just two channels and then gets re-expanded by the up mixer in my AV receiver, which does a better job than what the Xbox is doing inside of itself. That's kind of what I've resorted to. Now, again, on physical discs, this isn't a problem. On physical discs, it will switch between and put out a genuine bitstream, whatever was on the disc. It will automatically do that with physical discs. But for everything else, I mean, saying switch to a different sound output mode on the Xbox One, now nothing is in Atmos. (laughs) That's the problem there, unless you manually change it so no there's nothing you can do other than manually changing back and forth but i've resorted to just having the darn thing output stereo and then i can yeah. up mix it in my av receiver he says he also has a ps4 it's only audio output options are uncompressed pcm dolby digital or dts uh-huh. is there a way to get the ps4 to output the original bitstream so that his brands can do all the audio decoding instead other than physical discs 
nope. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> it's so. the same situation. Yeah. It's even worse than the PS3 because the PS3 got options yeah. to output bit streams. You could have the Dolby Digital Plus coming out of the Netflix app, right? Yep. Not on the PS4. The PS4 does the same thing the Xbox does. It decodes everything other than physical discs. Physical discs can do the full pass through, but everything oh, else so it decodes irritating. itself, and then you choose how you want to output it, and it doesn't even have an Atmos option. Uh, guess what I've done with my PlayStation 4? Stereo? <laughs> I've resorted to outputting everything in stereo. Yeah. All right. Not helpful. We are not helpful. Well, and it's not our fault. It's, it's not, not our a, fault. But, you know, I mean, he has an SR7010, the exact same I have. The upmixers are really good, yeah. and it upmixes stereo. Really well. Well, everything was down mixed inside of the console into that stereo. All the sound is still in there. Works. Yeah, I'm gonna have to try it. All right, how long is this? Oh, it's not long. Infinite Gary. Philips announced their new uh, OLED TVs at IFA, and they <laughs> spent a lot of time talking about their second generation P5 picture processor and their perfect natural reality uh -huh. SDR to HDR conversion. They've also explained that they've chosen to go with HDR 10 plus instead of Dolby Vision because no, I don't like Dolby and they mean to us and they make us pay money. We don't want to. We're Sony and we everybody sucks. That's kind of what they said. But instead they said, well, they not Sony because whatever <laughs> Phillips, because Dolby requires, I, I just assumed this was Sony because Dolby requires a default picture mode for Dolby Vision that just shows the Dolby Vision signal without any additional processing. And they want to apply their P5 process to everything by default. And if yes, they, they do. They, yes, they do. And apparently HDR10 Plus lets you do that. Um, yay. Yay. So they've, they're promoting their processing as natural and claiming to have the best image quality, but they're actually messing with all incoming signals, right? If it's on, yep. Mm -hmm. But despite altering the original signals, they were still given lots of positive press and reviews and handed several awards. So what's our takeaway from all this? Well, first of all, you buy those awards. I, <laughs> I'm, that's straight they're up. announced before the show begins, which that, seems it, weird to me. It's straight up. It's, it's straight up. You have to, to get one of the, any of those awards at any of these shows. In fact, most awards you see online from magazines or anything, they're not specifically bought, but they are specifically you to, to, to get an award you have or to be uh, you have to pay. Yes. No. To have your product considered. So you pay, your product gets considered, and then some panel or a person or whatever decides on what award you're gonna get. And if you throw enough products in there something's gonna get something <laughs> for sure and then they make sure that everybody gets something or they you know you won't apply you won't apply next year you know they make yeah. they try to make sure especially the big the big people uh and, and you know i'm i'm not saying that they didn't deserve whatever award they got but this is garbage okay <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> uh, no it is it is because you know this is the same sort of thing that we see over and over again with manufacturers where they're like we're going to differentiate ourselves by having this one thing. And because of that one thing, we're, you know, we're going to put all our eggs in that basket and then people are going to see that and they're going to hear that. And they're going to think, well, does anybody else have this one thing that they have? Right. And I've right, told right. the story for years now, but there was the lady who asked my friend, uh, who's going around the calling, you know, calling Best Buys and, just, and saying, yeah, right, right. You know, there was a Toshiba and they had their perfect picture processing or whatever it was, right? You ha does, does the Sony have that? No, they, Wasn't it back it, when it was component video and they called it like color stream or something? Yeah, something like it. that, right? <laughs> it was a very silly thing. And she was asking for the very specific thing that everybody the trademark does. trademark name that they came but it was up the with. Trade, yeah, yeah, exactly. The trademark name. And they and they were like, no, well, Sony's got this. Other. No, it's not the same thing. It's Toshiba's the best. You know, and, and that's fine. But what they're doing here, and, it's, and maybe they are going to have this picture or whatever processor thing that's messing with everything perfect but natural reality what a it, what a name <laughs> it, it was already you know it already had something you know it, it, nope. what was it before was everybody with smurfs and then you guys turned them all to not smurfs i mean i mean it, it, samsung has the lovely uh, equivalent thing with the wonderfully confusing name of hdr plus Right. They, right. So you got, they, they invented HDR10+, plus, but HDR+, plus is Samsung's version of converting SDR to HDR, which right. everybody has something that does that. Now, I liked Vincent Tio's take on this whole thing, because if there's anyone who's like a video purist, it's Vincent Tio. Right. But he's like, if you want to do SDR to HDR conversion, and some people do, right? It'd be silly to say that nobody out there wants to do that. He's like, if you want to do that. If you're watching low resolution sources, right? DVDs, 480p. Okay. He's like, if that's the situation, he thinks the Philips with this second generation of the P5 
does probably the best job of those things out of the TVs that he's seen. Now, he, being a video purist, still says there is a way to turn it off, so that's good, right? Yeah. It's great. There is a way to turn it off, so he's not going to knock the television. Uh, like, he'll knock a television if there's no way to turn it off and actually get it to accurate. But there is, so that's okay. And then if you activate it, because that's the thing you want to do, it does a good job of it. So I don't okay. have a problem with that. That's That seems fair. It's like, hey... If you're the person who wants to do this, it does a really good job. And if you don't, at least there is a way to turn it off. So that's okay in my opinion. Yeah, but the whole Dolby Vision is the, making, the Dolby making Vision us thing. making us do this other thing, and therefore yep. we're not going to play nice with them. And yep. they're not. This is the reason why we didn't pay. Whatever. I, mean, it I was, was amazed because they they, yeah. was, they were that candid about it because yeah. they were asked directly like, "How come no Dolby Vision support?" They're like, "Dolby requires that the default mode has no other picture processing applied to it, and by default we want to apply because that's our thing. That's what we do. We have this P5 that's processor. Fine. I mean, that's fine, but it's still really. I mean." They, they came up with the technology, which apparently works. I mean, yeah. I haven't seen it, so I don't know. But, uh, you know, and everything else is marketing excuses for why, you know, they don't have specific features. You know, they spent a lot of money, I'm sure, coming up with this technology. And they, you know, they've got to they've got to re return some of the, you know, get returns on some of that investment. Yep. And the way they do that is by making it sound like everything else is worse than them. But everybody says that, right? The QLEDs are better than OLED, and OLED yeah. is better than LCD, and LCD, you know, is you know kind of stupid. No, but I mean, I do think the name "perfect natural reality" for SDR to HDR conversion is a silly trademark name. Yeah. But uh, but what it does, and it does it apparently quite well compared to everybody else's SDR to HDR conversion. So, and you can turn it off if you want to. So, right. Yeah. I think we're going to skip the last question oh, sure. and yeah, save it for less next week because it's a uh, doozy. <laughs> it's a long answer, yeah. And it actually yeah. did come in like early, early on a Monday morning. So I say Sunday is the cutoff, so that's all fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, right. that's uh, that's Iris Z over on Facebook. We will answer you on the podcast uh, next next week. And uh, yeah, that was one of those ones where they're like, uh, short question, what does this mean? I'm like, the question is, is uh, short. short in the number of words. <laughs> the answer is not. So I, I didn't uh, type out a uh, novel to reply to Iris, uh, but we will answer on the podcast, not to worry. That's right. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. Uh, Brandon. Brandon went uh, to uh, www.avrent.com and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and gave us a little donation via PayPal. So we want to thank Brandon for his donation. Yeah, Brandon, thank you very much for that donation. We appreciate it. We want to thank our 67 patrons over at patreon.com for supporting us as well. Once again, all of those monies go into our coffers to help pay for uh, hosting fees and other such things. So thank you, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Yeah, that's uh, patreon.com slash podcast if you would like to sign up for a monthly automatic donation to the podcast. And thanks so much to our 67 patrons. I also want to thank Noah and Abhu for alerting us that the Google Play Music Store wasn't updating our podcast feed. And we want to thank Google for, you know, not just targeting at us and screwing up for a whole bunch of people. Yeah. So and, thank you. and actually responding via email, which I didn't I was, expect. But, uh, yeah, I was yeah. very surprised, though. I was very irritated when they, <laughs> they were like, but that was your, bad your, website, your website's down. That's why it's screwed up. Do you need up. to figure out why that bandwidth keeps getting exceeded? I don't so know. That is not right. There, we, keep, we keep increasing the bandwidth. <laughs> There's nothing on the website. We're not like hosting I, I, videos on the website. I really wish. I mean, what I need to do is I need I need a listener who is really good at WordPress and HTML and all that stuff, and just like let's give them like an admin. Right. Yeah, there for a there is bit. something crazy memory there's leak something going with that. on on that there's site. Some, that I feel no like sense. there's like like some sort of cryptocurrency thing going on on there. Somebody <laughs> hacked us and you know and we're streaming porn to something or something whatever. Mate, right. But Noah yeah. Abu, thank you very much for the heads up. All right. I stop, I hate that. And every podcast with all right. May, don't let me do it again, Rob. Oh, yes. Your fault. Yeah, I'm in charge of that as well now too, eh? <laughs> yes, eh? So with that, I guess I'm going to say so now. With that. <laughs> I'm Tom Andre. And uh, I, I have to start with all right because I don't know what to say. We also didn't say you can send questions to question at avrant.com. That's very important. That's this maybe is AV Rant, the podcast. What kind of a show answer. do we have without any questions? <laughs> question at avrant.com, please. Email us. That's right. Email your questions. Until next week, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.